John Brumby, thank you for joining us on Fabian's TV. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. Your recent book, The Long Haul, is described as a series of practical lessons on leadership and public life. Uh, as, and as someone who worked for you years ago, I can say this is a very authentically John Brumby book. It's crammed with facts and figures and lots of big ideas. So I encourage people to read it for themselves because there's a lot to take in from it. So without giving away the best bits of the book, can you just summarise for us what the key messages of the book are and what, what its relevance are to a general audience? Well, what I tried to do with the book was, you know, I didn't want to write um, a, a general autobiography. So it was really looking at all of those years in federal politics, state politics, opposition and in government, treasurer and premier. So what are the things that I've, I've learned? And one of the key observations through the book, and it, and it really goes back to my days in the Hawke and Keating governments, it's this idea of sort of reform or perish. And so I make the case out in the book that if you look at where Australia is today, uh, because of the changes in the world, the changes in our population, the size of the budget deficit, where the world economy is going, the end of the resources boom, it's an understatement, but we've got a lot of challenges. And we're not suddenly going to fix these challenges. And, you know, we've had four years in a row now in Australia of declining real incomes per head. Uh, and we need reform. We need change in the way in which government does things, uh, change in government policies, change in the way the Federation works, change in our tax system. And I go through all these areas. And then uh, um, I also draw out a number of the, the lessons that I learned from our time um, leading the Victorian government. Uh, and these are things like um, governing for the whole state. Might sound like a bit simplistic and a truism, but it was so important uh, for us and for the Labor Party. Uh, prevention is better than cure, which is really talking about preventative health and particularly diabetes and what we need to do in that space. Uh, there's a chapter there called The Footy and the Synchrotron, um, which is really about uh, the sort of economy and society that I think we need today. So you've got to be high tech you know, building the, the synchrotron, um, but you've also got to have your, your community foundations, your roots, the things that hold us together, like, and so footy in the synchrotron. So there's a lot of chapters like that as well. So that's just a, a quick snapshot, and I go through the, uh, the things that need changing, the reform agenda. So did you write the book because you're disappointed in the current state of Australian politics? Well, I wrote, I wrote the book actually because, um, so Joel Dean, you know, Joel's book, Catch or Kill, and Joel started writing his book, and I, and I was very keen for, uh, for there to be a story about the 11 years of the Brax and Brumby Labor government in Victoria, and Joel started writing it. And then, I think as most people know, midway through that, Joel, he had a, a stroke, a, a, and he's fine now, thankfully, but he thought, that's it, I'm not going to finish the book. And so people said, well, JB, you've got to write the book. And as it happened, Joel finished his book anyway, and I finished mine. So we've got two books. So it's a bit of, it's a bit of history. It's a bit of telling the story. Um, but really, it's a bit about stimulating debate, because I've always thought that politics is really, you know, it is about the battle of ideas. Uh, and I've always believed in that. I've been passionate about that. So this book, it, it's about ideas. I don't say they're particularly revolutionary, but it's ideas that I think, from my experience, can be implemented that will make our society and um, uh, community and economy better. Well, you're being a bit modest when you say some of them aren't revolutionary, I want to point you to one section of the, of the book which I think is, some people might think is pretty radical. I'm just going to read the quote from it. It says, uh, much research has been done since the 1990s on the relationship between environment, society and economy while the outdated mentality holds that society and environmental benefits can only flow from a booming economy, there is now a growing recognition that the causal pattern runs in the other direction as well. That is, a fair and livable society is not just a possible result of economic prosperity, but also one of its conditions. Conversely, to damage the social and, and environmental fabric is to undermine the foundations for a strong and healthy economy. That's pretty radical, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, I don't know how radical that is, but, it, but if you read the book, it goes back and I talk about the years when Jeff Kennett was Premier, and I talk about that era and how it was very vigorous and very contested, uh, but my inaugural speech in the Upper House, and I talked about uh, Jeff's famous or infamous comments that, you know, the, the, 
the thin man, the thin man can only get fat when the fat man gets fatter. And, you know, I said in my inaugural speech what, how offensive I found that. And that really led to this broader discourse about what are the preconditions for a strong and healthy and growing economy and society. And the fact is that one of those preconditions um, is an inclusive society. It is one where you've got a fair distribution of wealth, where people feel part of the community, where they feel that they're communicating, where people have got the skills, the tools to go on and improve their lives. So I don't think that's too revolutionary, but, but, but the reason I emphasised it was to say how I thought in those early years of the Kennett government, um, certainly he needed to make, the government needed to make expenditure cuts, but those cuts were of such an intensity and ferocity uh, that they in fact held back economic growth. People left our state in droves and there were so many people who thought that they were sort of cut off from the dialogue, from the discourse, from the broader society. So it, it was um, simply making the point that that was the wrong way to go at the time and that if you really want to get the best in terms of sustainable growth then this in inclusiveness is really crucial. So then later on in the book, you have a chapter entitled The AAA Matters, which makes the case for why um, tight fiscal management must be a top priority for government. But isn't that the usual excuse for why we can't do the kinds of things that, that you're talking about, that make society more inclusive, that protect the environment, that look after our society? No, I don't think so. And, it, you know, I know everyone won't agree with um, what I've said in that chapter. And I know, you know, particularly on the Labor side of politics, that there will be um, a, a lot of debate about that. But... Uh, I think, you know, if you look at our history in Victoria, uh, when we had a strongly growing economy, we delivered good surpluses and we were able to put that money aside. And I think it's no secret that uh, when the GFC came along, we were in a strong position and we were able to get through the GFC in Victoria in much better shape than any other state in Australia with lower levels of unemployment and better levels of prosperity. And it was because, you know, we'd, we'd put aside for a rainy day. But I think the AAA matters too because um, if, 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 if the pot of money is never ending, then you never really apply any strict criteria or discipline to the way in which you spend money. And, you know, I think in Victoria, for example, if we hadn't been, people might think this is a funny thing to say, but if we hadn't had a view about the AAA and a view about responsible debt levels, I don't think we would have got a fair of Victoria, for example. And indeed the cabinet process that drove a fair of Victoria, when we all went away on retreat and we had to, to write down and talk about the most important things that could be a legacy of a decade of Labor government, there were two that jumped out. You know, the environment was important and education was important and health was important and all of those, but the two that jumped out were fiscal sustainability, you know, a strong budget, and secondly, a fair of Victoria. And the reason we did a fair of Victoria, if you, if, you know, if, if people remember back, was we used to go along the budget and we'd have a certain amount to spend in the budget. And you'd have 800 budget bids. And when you analyse them, 600 of them were all these bitsy little bids from departments scattered around that were really all about one thing. They're all about building a fair of Victoria. And we used to spend a huge amount of time and effort and argument on all these tiny little things. So we thought, why don't we distill down what it is we want to do, that is, a fair of Victoria. What are the key elements or criteria of that? So tackling disadvantage, um, early intervention was a key part of that. And let's aggregate all of those bids. And we did that around a cabinet committee that was firstly chaired by John Thwaites and then by Rob Hulls. And I think it was one of the best things we did. And if people look back at the legacy of our period in government, a fair of Victoria was a big part of it. Again, it wasn't revolutionary. People might have said we could have spent more, we could have done more. Governments can always do that. But it brought um, a real focus to what we were doing as a government. And if you look at some of the things in early intervention in particular, we, we led Australia, there's no doubt about that. And I know in my own electorate of Broadmeadows, Things like getting disadvantaged and Indigenous students into preschools and getting them the best start, tackling disability, these things wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without a fair of Victoria. And a fair of Victoria wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had some fiscal discipline forcing us to think, how can we do more with 
the, with, the, with the same quantum of resources. So you're clearly still passionate about social justice and an inclusive society and a fairer society. Are you optimistic about the direction Australia is heading in over the next few decades? Are we going to become a more inclusive society in your view? Um, no, I'm not sure about that. I think, uh, you know, we've got some big challenges and there are challenges, to be honest, um, I don't want to sound like a treasurer again, but, you know, there are cha challenges on the, the revenue side and there are challenges on the expenditure side. And I think um, certainly uh, the current government um, and to some extent uh, its Labor predece predecessor, we really haven't had a proper national dialogue about this. I've got a chapter in my book on tax reform. Not everyone will agree with it, but I make the point there that um, health spending, you know, health spending is the biggest part of state budgets. Um, it's one of the biggest part of the Commonwealth budget. It affects people's lives probably more than any other area of government activity. It's not a bad thing to be spending money on health as long as you do it efficiently and effectively. It's not a bad thing. It helps people live um, better and longer lives, but you've got to be able to pay for it. So, you know, I've got a chapter in there on tax. I'd say that our general tax revenues are not high enough across Australia, so there does need to be an increase in taxation. So I talk about the GST there, not everyone agrees with that, but I talk about it because I say that if you want um, state governments in particular, after the $57 billion worth of budget cuts, which are real, which the Abbott government made, if you want the same levels of health expenditure or growing levels of health expenditure going forward, then you need the revenue to pay for it. So this is going to be an uncomfortable debate, I think, for Australia. Um, you're seeing some of the state premiers talk about that. Um, today, the date of doing this interview, I heard Jill Hennessy, the state health minister, talking about these things. So health spending per se is not a bad thing, but you've got to be able to pay for it. And to be able to pay for it, we need additional revenue. So we really haven't had that debate across Australia. I think the Abbott and Turnbull governments are really dodging that debate. They're saying we're going to have tax reform and, you know, it's the Reagan-esque view of the world. We can all pay lower taxes and spend more and we'll live happily ever after. And the world's not quite as simple as that because we do have a lot of national budget debt at the moment and future generations have to pay for that. So you've had a 30-year career in politics, influential roles at a federal and state level. Uh, obviously, you've had incredible opportunities to shape public policy, but looking at, uh, at young people today who are kind of progressive and interested in, in making a difference in society, but feel a bit disillusioned by party politics and, and mm. you know, sort of capital P politics of Australia, would you encourage them to still think about a career in politics like yours as, a, as the best way to make a big difference, or is it different now? Are there other ways that they should be you know, spending their energy. Younger people today, they're much more um, outward looking, much more global in their outlook, um, uh, much broader in their view of uh, social and political issues than um, people of my generation. You know, so if you look at attitudes, for example, to, to China, for example, attitudes on the environment, on things like gay marriage, um, it's a, they're a much broader thinking and, and more globally focused group. So I think that's a very positive thing. You know, it's always good to have an open mind. You know, I think it's so important and have a broad view of the world. So, um, so that generation's got huge opportunities, uh, but I think they're disillusioned too with the way, to be honest, the way all the major political parties are run. Um, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to run a political party or to lead one today. I think it's extraordinarily difficult. But, you know, they're, they're disillusioned. And I think the young people I know are, are happy to embrace some reform, uh, happy, you know, they, they want to see much more action on climate change, um, which, you know, I advocate, of course, in my book. Um, they want to see... Uh, I advocate in the book two more free votes in the parliament. Not, not so many that we, we become like the American system where we're basically run by lobbyists, but more free votes. And again, I think on the big issues, you know, the big social issues, we did this with abortion law reform, but you can think of gay marriage as one that, you know, just jumps out. 
um, people want to have a debate about these things and they don't want parliamentarians fettered by being locked into whichever union supported them or whichever faction supported them or so on. So, so I think our political system has to change. Uh, and again, I spent a whole chapter on this in the book about reforming parliament and making it more meaningful. And I think that'll appeal to a lot of young people. But, you know, the Labor Party's got to change, the Liberal Party's got to change, um, and the way in which the parliament works have to change. So finally, you've had a long association with the Australian Fabians. You've spoken at many of our events. We even wrote a book on democratic renewal years ago that was published by the Fabians. But do you think there's still a need in the modern era for an organisation like the Fabians? Well, as long as people can keep turning up to, to events, I, you know, I think that's the test. Um, and to read the literature or look at the website material, you know, that's, that's the test. Um, so, you know, we've got more information and, and um, you know, it's a more competitive environment than ever before. But, uh, you know, the, the point about the Fabians is, is it's about change. It's about making change and making change gradually, but it's about making change. And um, it's about better ways of doing things and better ways of seeing the world. And um, so I think there's a role for that. And, you know, again, the reason I got interested in politics was about the ideas. And, you know, I, I think even my critics over the years would say, well, whatever you think of John Brumby, he's always been open to new ideas. And I think I have. And so um, politics you know, and, and your question before, is it a good profession? Yes, it is, because it's about um, the battle of ideas. It's about improving people's lives. So it's still a, a noble profession, and I always encourage people to do it. And if you want to get involved in politics, um, you need to be immersing yourself in ideas and organisations which discuss and promote and, I guess, promulgate, you know, good ideas. And, and that really, to, uh, the last chapter of my book is about, you know, where does Australia go in the future? And I talk about innovation, it's always been a passion of mine, but I think I, I, I say in the book we should be in the new business, you know, um, new ideas, new ways of doing things, new ways of generating energy, um, new ways of making the parliament work better, um, new, new businesses, you know, to set up and to... Uh, to, to meet the growing demands of particularly the Asia and China. Um, so we should be in the new business. So I think for anyone who wants to be in the political business, the Fabians um, still have a, a really crucial and important role in opening up that battle of, of ideas and looking at the best ways forward. Thank you for your time, John Brumby. Thanks, Tim.